in Wanted, Chapter 31. By two o'clock in the morning, we reached the beach. The docks where I worked during the day delivering fish to the market were now vacant. At the end of a narrow and secluded wharf, a small wooden rowboat waited for us. We ran across the shore. With every step I took, the sand became wetter and softer until salty water seeped into my flip-flops. A dark figure of a man jumped from the boat and waved to Mrs. Duong. She waved back. Good evening. You are on time. His bare chest where the light hit was contoured with oily sweat and rippling muscles. His thin lips didn't quite cover his large buck teeth, which glowed in the dark like a fluorescent light. Mrs. Duong and I huddled together on the bench near the aft of the boat. The man rowed skillfully, checking his compass now and again for the direction. His ferry headed east past a clump of dark islands, which were almost invisible in the mist. Above us, the sky flickered with a million stars. The round moon reflected the ocean's waves into silver coins spilling over the water's surface. The salty air's soft touch caressed my skin. Like a tiny leaf in a pond, the boat skimmed the surface in silent rhythm. Where are we going, Auntie? Where are the other people? I asked Mrs. Duong. Quiet, the man answered. Kid, the less you know, the better off you are. So shut up. We are going to Turtle Island, Mrs. Duong said to me. There we'll wait for another, bigger boat. The ocean seemed to expand around us. On the side of the boat, the waves made a steady murmur. Here we are, the man finally said. Facing the stern, I was unaware we had reached the island until the bottom of our boat came into contact with the rocky ground. Listen to me, the man said, as he searched for a place to dock. This is Turtle Island. Like the name, it is shaped like a turtle. The island is off limits to civilians. The turtle's body is the mountain. The beaches are its legs. The mountain has three layers. We are going to the middle part. If we go too high up, terrorists and leftover gorillas of the old government will kill us. If we get too close to the beach, we'll be in the hands of the communists. They like to shoot first and ask questions later. Be extremely careful. Sometimes we run into illegal lumberjacks. Avoid them too if possible. The big boat will come tomorrow night. Now let's get out of here before the brown dogs smell us. He was referring to the communist police who wore dark brown uniforms. Turtle Island was a lush jungle filled with tropical trees and thick clumps of wild berries. Bushes grew past the shore and reached out into the water, making it an ideal place to hide out. We walked deeper into the forest on a narrow path across the swampy ground. Each time we moved, clouds of flies and mosquitoes swirled up, breaking the quiet with their buzzing. The man handed us each a knapsack. Take this, he said. It contains your portions and some blankets for tonight. Watch out for the quicksand. Keep your feet steady on the rocks and don't forget to keep an eye out for snakes. We ran in single file through the wet and torturous road leading to the middle part of the turtle's hump. Under our feet, the muddy ground was covered with dead leaves that sloshed as we marched farther uphill. The rest of the escapees were waiting for us in a large open area not far from the trail. There must have been about 30 people, all women and children. Not one was younger than 10 years old. Their plastic mats were scattered on the ground, held down by rocks. Some of the women huddled under the blankets against the cold wind. The only men in the group were the two leaders. The young man who brought us to the camp was Khan Jr. The older man was his father, Khan Sr. He had just been released from a death camp a few months earlier. As I learned later, the old man had been an army sergeant under the old government. He too was bare chested and barefoot. A pair of faded cut off khaki shorts covered the lower half of his body and in his thin waistband, I could see the steel handle of a pistol. 
A large, ugly scar on his left cheek sprang to life like an animated lizard every time he spoke. His black eyes glared as he introduced us to everybody else. We were told to share a space under a wild tamarind tree with two other people, a teenage girl and her younger brother. Mrs. Zhuang sat on a rock, worn out from the long height. She beckoned to me, wiping the perspiration off her forehead. Come here, Kian. You can rest next to me. Welcome to Turtle Island, the boy said to me. He was about 15 years old, his face covered with freckles and his eyes slanted like those of a puppet character from a Chinese opera. He and I were the oldest boys among the children. His sister, who was a few years older, had beautiful hands and feet. I helped her clear the dead leaves from our rest area. She looked up to smile at me. Her face with its high cheekbones appeared pale in contrast to her red lips. She too reminded me of a character in the opera playhouse, a marionette princess. From far beyond the trees, the sun peeked its carroty face over the dark blue water, sweeping away the silvery darkness. Some of the children ate breakfast out of their knapsacks. Soon, the shells of hard-boiled eggs and banana skins littered the ground. The women watched their children and daydreamed about their new lives in America. Come here, darling, Mrs. Zhuang said from behind me. Let me comb your hair for you. I sat down in front of her, feeling the soft touch of her fingers on my scalp. She said softly above me, Isn't this exciting? Tonight we'll be boarding the boat. Who knows, in a short week we might get to Hong Kong or the Philippines or Malaysia and then to America. I definitely would like to settle in California and look for my children. Together, you and me, we'll get a small house by the sea, like Na Trang almost. And when my children come to join us, you'll be their big brother. You'll go to school and study anything you like. Then you can sponsor your family to America. Is this a nice dream? Instead of answering, I snuggled closer to her body. That evening, we ate the caramel chicken that had been packed into our knapsacks while Khan Jr. left the camp to wait for the boat signaled by the shore. We huddled in the dark covered with the thin blankets, cold but full of hope. Some of the children fell asleep while others stirred restlessly. An old woman squatted down on the ground to urinate. Somebody tried to muffle a cough. Around us, the jungle hid inside a dense fog. Curled up against the tree, I slipped into a deep sleep in Mrs. Zhuang's warm embrace. When I awoke, the morning sky was as white as milk. The fog had lifted from the tall trees, except for a few tendrils that lingered in the blue shadow of the forest. In front of me, Mrs. Zhuang and a few other women were talking with Khan Jr. I clutched the blanket around my shoulders and walked over to join them. An air of sadness hung over everyone. I am sorry. I don't know anything else. We just have to wait, Khan Jr. said to the women. Wait for what and for how long? Someone asked him. He walked away. I don't know, but we may be here for a couple more days. What is happening? I asked Mrs. Zhuang. She noticed me for the first time. Her eyes wore the frightened look of a trapped animal. Someone stole the boat last night, she said. Oh, God. The big boat that takes us to America? I uttered in shock. No. She shook her head. The small ferry. About the ship, we couldn't get any signal from them, so we are stranded here with no way out. What do we do? We wait, she said mechanically, echoing Con Jr.'s answer. The second day went by uneventfully. We huddled next to each other to keep warm. Mrs. Zhuang watched me eat the cold food without touching her own. Above us, dark clouds started to form. On the third day, it rained. I ran out on the soggy ground, joining the other children to take a shower, while at the same time storing rainwater in the empty bottles for future use. The adults hid under the surrounding trees to keep from getting wet. Hope had dwindled along with our food supplies. Below us, the ocean moved like a giant dish of blue jello under the sweeping winds. 
On the fifth day, the women scattered into the jungle in groups to search for wild mushrooms, berries, and greens, while the two men fished at a nearby stream. The island offered little in the way of food. Sea spinach and wild berries were among the meager vegetables we harvested near the swamp. Despite the elders' warning, we ate the cooked vegetables and became violently ill that night. The next morning, when the cold rain revisited the island, we washed the vomit off our clothes. As hungry as we were, the incident instilled a fear in all of us, and everyone gave up the food search. The children sucked on the last of the raw candies while the adults slept their starvation away. On the afternoon of the sixth day, Mrs. Zhuang pulled me deep into the woods away from the other escapees. Not until we were at least 30 feet away from the camp did she unwrap her shawl and show me the contents. Three hard-boiled eggs appeared like props in a magic trick. Her darling. She whispered to me, eat them quickly before someone sees us. Unable to tear my eyes away from the food in her hands, I asked her, where did you get these? I saved them for you, she answered. I swallowed loudly. What about you, auntie? Aren't you hungry? No, darling. She smiled and shook her head. They are yours. Go ahead, eat them. Back at the camp, Khan Sr. was holding an emergency meeting. Mrs. Duong and I joined the rest of the runaways on the dirty ground. He stood on a rock in front of us, licking his lips nervously. Like everyone else, he had lost a lot of weight in the last six days. His chest caved inward and his rib cage stuck out from his torso. Let's talk about our alternatives, he asked the crowd. Who among us want to surrender to the brown dogs? A wave of dissent swept the group. People cursed the boat that never came, blamed their own bad luck on each other, jumped up and down and shouted at one another. Khan Senior waved his hands to quiet them down. Be quiet, he yelled. There's still hope. The group froze. There is a way out, he continued. We have a gun. We can steal a motorboat from the illegal lumberjacks and escape. Who wants to take this risk? Let me see a show of hands. Don't those woodsmen have weapons with them? A woman asked. What if we lose? Khan Senior shrugged. We don't have much choice, madam. If we lose, we die. But if we surrender or do nothing, we also die. I searched Mrs. Duong's face for guidance, but she turned away. I stood up. All eyes were on me as I spoke. I don't want to surrender. Just like all of you, I got stuck here because I was searching for freedom. Let freedom guide us out of here. Someone cried out from behind me, well put child, let's fight for a ride home. There were whimpers of disagreement among the women, but most of them finally agreed that we should seize control of a boat. Khan Senior looked at me and asked, what is your name, son? Kian. And you? He turned toward the boy with slanted eyes who stood next to his sister under a tree. Bon, the boy answered. The old man then said, my son and I will attack the loggers from behind. Can you two back us up? No, Mrs. Zhuang and the boy's sister cried simultaneously. Sorry, ladies, he said. I need them to balance the fight. What do we have to do? I asked him. Take me instead, Mrs. Zhuang said holding onto my arm tightly. I can fight if I have to. Leave my boy out of this. Not a possibility, he told her. In the old days, whenever I tangled with death, I needed my men. Death is here right now, and your son will do just fine.